This presentation is intended to look over the ways that we can reduce astigmatism after cataract surgery and lens-based surgery, particularly with limbal relaxing incisions. As we know, this is only one component included in the important elements associated with getting the best results with refractive cataract surgery and lens-based refractive surgery, but it's a very important element. As we know, anything over three quarters of a diopter of astigmatism is going to create problems with uncorrected visual acuity after these procedures. If we look at the mix of patients that are coming in preoperatively for these procedures, we know that we're already ahead of the game a bit. About three quarters of these patients will likely not need any surgery on the cornea in order to reduce astigmatism, but plenty will. In fact, if we look at the amount of cylinder that we create with our phaco incisions, it's a half a diopter and now much less with microincision cataract surgery when we're using 1.8 millimeter incisions. So, if we're looking at how much cylinder we're going to see in patients that do not have limb relaxing incisions, it's going to be around a third that will have problem astigmatism, and those patients are likely to complain a bit about uncorrected visual acuity, especially if we're using presbyopic IOLs. So there's a new paradigm that's established now in lens surgery, and that's to correct those eyes that are likely to have over three quarters of a diopter of astigmatism. Now we have a ways to do that, and not just limb relaxing incisions, which are also called peripheral corneal relaxing incisions or peripheral AK, but we also have laser correction, which can be performed after this procedure, and toric IOLs during the surgery. And if we look at these procedures, limb relaxing incisions, they really have been misnamed. They're not really uh, at the limbus. If they are at the limbus, they're not going to correct the cylinder that we need to correct. They're usually placed in my hands one to one and a half millimeters anterior to the surgical limbus. We like to follow the limbal curvature. In fact, that's one of the real advantages of this procedure is that there's this template of the limbus. We just follow that template and not the nice curvature of these incisions is why they're able to give us predictable results. They can be single or paired. Uh, since we're so far out in the periphery and with low levels of astigmatism, single incisions do not tend to cause irregular astigmatism like those that are placed more central. Now, there's been a significant amount of reluctance to limb relaxing incisions, and I've been teaching these for over 10 years, and I've seen many surgeons try and just give up. Uh, some find that they just don't work. Uh, they're like RK in some patients. Uh, experience with RK has not been great, and so the surgeons are not that willing to go in that direction with incisional corneal surgery. Uh, they can be painful, especially before we learned how to reduce pain after the procedures. Uh, there can be just too much trouble, I mean, too much of effort for the surgeon to put forward with the FACO procedure, too. And uh, the instrumentation uh, is thought to be expensive, and so certain surgeons are not willing to take out, take the time and the effort and also the expense associated with LRIs. And also, I think they've been associated with astigmatic keratotomy, and they aren't really the same. In many ways, they're quite a bit different. They're faster healing in my experience. There's less pain in the immediate postoperative period. There's less irregular astigmatism in the immediate postoperative period. And they're definitely easier to perform than AK along with RK that we used to do years ago. And what about toric IOLs compared to limbal relaxing incisions? Well, there are certain advantages of toric IOLs, and they've been very successful uh, in the hands of surgeons these days. Uh, there's less predictability with toric IOLs. The results vary a little more with LRIs. Uh, there's a need for additional instrumentation to LRIs, uh, not so with toric IOLs. Uh, there's not the foreign body sensation or the potential for infection or perforation that all LRIs have when we use toric IOLs. But there are advantages that LRIs have over toric IOLs. Probably the most important one is that we can use these procedures on, for all IOLs, including presbyopic IOLs. It treats the problem of stigmatism at its source, at the corneal plane. Uh, there's low risk and long track record of safety, many years of safety, and it has a r rapid result, a refractive stability that's incredibly good even one day out. There's no additional IOL inventory. You don't have to special order these lenses. It's not limited to one piece blue blocker lenses. It's lower cost than toric IOLs, and we can enhance the astigmatism with LRIs postoperatively, not true with toric IOLs. So even if a surgeon is using toric IOLs and wants to touch up astigmatism with the unhappy patient after surgery, this is a great option for them. 
Well, what's been some of the stumbling blocks associated here? Well, quite a few, but what I have learned by teaching courses on LRIs now for some time is that once a surgeon understands the benefits of LRIs, has confidence with the system that's available to them, and is comfortable with the technique, then this becomes just routine and used quite frequently for their patients. Uh, there are some specific elements about LRIs in the United States that differ from uh, the procedure, the FACO procedure itself. If people want to charge for these uh, procedures, they can, but they have to bill separately, file what's called an Advanced Beneficiary Notice, or ABN. And also, this is when it, we have to explain the procedure to the patient. If they're going to be paying for something, we have to explain what it is we're doing. And so we have to look at using an LRI informed consent. Now, this is where we can get into problems in the clinic because uh, patients don't really understand astigmatism that well, even if you show them a corneal map. And we've tried different methods to explain astigmatism and how we can reduce astigmatism. And we found this real high-tech method. It's really not high-tech at all. It's just a spoon that we have in each room comparing that to a doorknob. The three-dimensional aspect of this really hits home for patients and their families. When we can show them that the shape of their cornea is more like the back of the spoon and not like the doorknob, and that we need to change the shape with these procedures in order to reduce the amount of astigmatism with these number relaxing incisions, then they understand, and of course we're charging for these, now they understand the significance in, in helping normalize the surface of the eye. When it comes to planning, this is important. We compare the the K's, the refractive cylinder, corneal topography, any other elements that we have in the practice that will help us decide how much astigmatism is present. We tend to lean toward the keratometric cylinder and right now we're using the IOL Master version 5 which has better keratometry and that's been our, our primary source for information in terms of how to plan for LRIs. But if these measurements don't seem to compare well, if there's not some similarity among the different measurement systems that we have for that patient, we typically will just not do an LRI at the time of surgery and look for any problem with astigmatism afterward and treat them postoperatively. And we have a normogram that we use here uh, in my practice that I've uh, put together many years ago. Uh, but whatever nomogram we are using, we encourage that nomogram to be personalized. There are actually quite a few nomograms out there, including one from Dr. Gills, Dr. Lindstrom, Dr. Nickham, and, my, and myself. So be looking at the one that works best for you in your practice and one that's been out there for a while and tried and true. Now, this is an example of the nomogram I've been using for some time. This is for against the rule astigmatism. It has broken into different age groups and then the amount of astigmatism and because at older age groups tend to heal slower and uh, or, or you don't have to do as much surgery on an older patient so you have to grade these similar to RK years ago. Let's take this example of a patient that came to see us a number of years ago with cortical cataract um, wanting a presbyopic IOL. In mid-60s, you can see from the refraction that there's a diopter and a half of astigmatism with axis at 179. If we compare that with the keratometry, there's quite a bit of similarity here. The same amount of astigmatism. The axis is a little different, and this is real-world astigmatism evaluation. This is where it gets a little confusing. The preoperative planning can be a little confusing. You have to decide where you're going to put the axis when there's not the exact same axis. Quite often seen in lower amounts of astigmatism, the axis won't compare perfectly with the refraction and the keratometry and the coronal topography. So there's some guesstimation as to where to put the axis in lower levels of astigmatism. Once you reach over two or three diopters of astigmatism, there's much better correlation of axis. So in this patient, we go to the nomogram and find one and a half diopters of astigmatism. It calls for a single incision in this age group with a 60 degree arc. This was performed, uh, one incision, 60 degree arc at five. I sort of split the difference here in this patient and wound up with a great result of a half a diopter, a spherical uh, error in 2020 acuity with correction in 2025 without with a J2 near. Very happy patient. So this is the sort of thing we can offer our patients with presbyopic eye wells, and we don't have to exclude astigmatism patients. Procedure I use involves instrumentation manufactured by stores uh, with Bosch and Loam. Uh, it is an easy system to use, uh, easier than a lot of other systems I've seen, and I think there's been a lot of reluctance to LRIs because of the complex nature of some of the instrumentation. This involves just the use of a preset diamond knife at 600 microns, a Mendez axis marker. These axis markers have numbers on them. 
It really helps surgeons stay oriented during surgery when there are numbers that they're looking at and not just slashes on an instrument, something that can orient them and keep them out of trouble with limb relaxing incisions. Uh, point one, two forceps, these are Calibri style forceps, angled nicely so that we can get to even hard to reach eyes, that I use to mark the cornea, no dye needed, just divoting the cornea, and then also using the same uh, instrument to fixate the globe during the procedure. This is a trifacet diamond tip, so it doesn't dull as easily as a sharp tip. It's plenty sharp and does the job with a single foot plate so that we can visualize the blade as it's going through corneal tissue. And that's important here to actually see what's going on with enough certainty to make these arcuate incisions uh, with some regularity and some predictability.